So, let's talk first about Ghostbusters Afterlife. So, as of right now, the film has made $63.7 million worldwide. This is a film that is, of course, not going to be much of a uh, major international uh, success just because Ghostbusters, even in general, going back to the films from the 80s, have not really been international sensations. It's been very much a domestic uh, property, has done very well amongst American audiences especially. And so uh, that's kind of what we can expect from this film going forward. The $47.8 uh, million it's made so far, that includes the Monday, uh, which had a pretty decent hold. I think it only dropped about 65% or so Sunday to Monday, which is, a, again, a pretty strong hold in general for a film. Now, here's the thing with Ghostbusters Afterlife, though, of why the film and why a lot of us are talking, people who talk about box office are talking about the film being a, uh, a success, at least at this point in time. The reason why is for a couple of reasons. One, the budget. It only costs $75 million to actually make this movie. That is half of what they spent on Ghostbusters 2016. So when you take that into account, and then you realize that this film is not that far behind Ghostbusters of 2016, you start to realize that, oh, this film is actually in a very good position. Whereas Ghostbusters 2016 was a massive flop that had a lot of well-warranted hatred from the fan base because it was not a good film. I know that a lot of people still like to throw out the misogyny. No, 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 no. Let's, let's be honest with ourselves. What was the sales pitch for that movie? In all honesty, what was the sales pitch for Ghostbusters 2016? Oh, what if we just had the Ghostbusters but had them all be women? And then we take the secretary who actually has and is a great personality from the original series. And then let's turn him into a dumb jock man. Like that is basically the jumping off point for Ghostbusters 2016. Like that, that's the reason why the, the film, it, it, it got so much, uh, again, rightfully so, got so much criticism. And the reason why this film in comparison is getting so much love is because this is essentially Ghostbusters 3. I know it's. I know people get triggered whenever I say that because there's some like, oh, it's not really. Well, hey, this this is the closest you're ever gonna get. This is the closest you're ever gonna get to a Ghostbusters three. This is one where it respects the source material. All right, it, it gives homage to the source material. There's tons of film, uh, tons of moments throughout the movie filled with nostalgia. It's nostalgia done right, and it's clearly being shown in the box office because this film was was projected by Sony. So again, Sony's projections for this movie was only 30.5, like 25 to 30 million domestically. It ended up at 44. So that already is a pretty imp impressive feat. You add on top of that the budget, and you start to realize, okay, this is a film that is a very good chance of breaking even rather quickly. Not just at all. I think that the fact that it'll break even is, is kind of a foregone conclusion based on how well it is being received by audiences. But... I want to say that the film could actually get relatively close or at least get, uh, get a lot further along after this week because Thanksgiving week, of course, is a big week for a lot of different things, right? Families coming together in general. It's also a week in which a lot of people tend to just say, hey, let's go to the films as a family and go and watch it, right? Let's go and see a movie together. Let's go ahead and you know take and enjoy this time off that we have. And so that, I think, is going to be a huge benefit for Ghostbusters Afterlife because it is a family movie. It's not a kid's movie. I, I, I've heard that falsity being thrown around too, right? Oh, it's a kid's movie. No, it's not. It's a family movie. There, there's literally something in this movie for the entire family. It's the very definition of a family film. It earns its PG-13 rating as well. There's a couple of moments that have some pretty scary factor to it. I don't think it's as scary as, as the original um, in some of the uh, things that were presented in the original film, but it is still there. And then there is some language throughout the film too. So it earns its rating, right? It earns its rating. And it is still one though that is made for the family. So because it's a family movie, it means it's a movie that the entire family can go to. That's a lot of tickets that can be sold. That is also a lot of concession items that can be bought as well. So this movie is not just good for uh, the studio, right? It's not just good for them in releasing this. It's also good in that it's going to be good for theaters because if if families are going and showing up to this film, which right now that seems to be the case because the strongest part of any of the days of its release was the early matinee shows, which is typically 
very much dominated by family audiences. So if that trend continues throughout this week, even theaters near me, which typically only have screenings as early as like 2 p.m. because of the state of the box office right now, tomorrow they're they're opening up as early as 11. And, th- and then again, that's incredibly early for theaters near me. So I would say here that this is something that absolutely needs to be uh, brought up and, and needs to be considered as being a strong point going forward for this movie. Not to mention, it's a little over two hours, and so you can get a lot of showtimes in as well. So it's looking pretty good for Ghost Budget Afterlife right now. It already overperformed the weekend. It overperformed the projections. It even overperformed the updated projections. So when they get their Friday numbers in, these experts, they like to make their adjustments, and they would say, that for this film, they said, oh, now we expect it to make $40 million. It even did better than that by the end of it. And again, a big part of that are the families that are going to see this uh, movie. Now, in comparison to what we see from the uh, from the 20, 2016 Ghostbusters, right? Sometimes known as woke busters or female Ghostbusters. In comparison, to this film, as of right now, when we compare it, and let me go ahead and make sure that this is uh, put on to adjust for inflation because that's the only really fair way to look at it. What we see from this, right, is that at the same point in its release, Ghostbusters 2016 was at 53.9 million domestically, whereas this film is at 47.8 million domestically. So some would say, okay, well, Ghostbusters 2016 is winning. Here's the issue. Ghostbusters 2016 had terrible word of mouth, It was not well-received by audiences. In comparison to this film, which is well-received by audiences, which is getting a major release, and not to mention, of course, even in the midst of pandemic, even the midst of pandemic, is going to be probably one of the best performers over the holiday frame. Now, I I think that Encanto from Disney uh, definitely will be putting up a fight, though even for that movie, their projections are relatively low. For the domestic market. And I just found out, confirmed, that it's not even a hybrid release like I'd been mentioning in my videos. Because every time I saw the uh, release information for Encanto, I'm like, this film has to be hybrid release. They're, they're saying that this film is only expected to make like $35, $40 million in its opening frame. That's terrible. That, that, that's garbage for a, a, a Disney animated movie. So you're looking then at a movie in Ghostbusters Afterlife that could actually give Encanto a run for its money because it's, it's not the same in that it's not a kid's movie like Encanto is, but it is one where, Hey, maybe if I'm a family, I would rather go to see Ghostbusters Afterlife than to go see Encanto. I don't know. It's going to be interesting to watch as the days unfold, how much money it's able to get. And what I think is going to happen and obviously, we'll have to wait for this bef- you know, to actually happen before I can uh, say anything else more really about it, is that I would not be surprised if by the second weekend here, right, where Ghostbusters 2016 was at $91 million, I would not be surprised if Ghostbusters Afterlife is either at that same level or is in the process of surpassing it. So by the end of its entire run, and it dropped off like, again, it it had a massive drop off really after that, going into the third, fourth week, just did not have a lot of legs. The film ended around $134.8 million by the end of its run. That's Ghostbusters 2016. It also had, again, really no showing whatsoever in the international box office. Now, this is a place where we'll probably see similar numbers Uh, Maybe some worse numbers, right? So this is a movie that still needs to release in certain areas, but this has never been known to be an international property. But I do honestly think that by the end of the run, we're going to see Ghostbusters Afterlife, at the very least, be able to get somewhat within this range. And if it doesn't, here's the kicker. Here's the key piece of information. Even if it doesn't get to the same level that Ghostbusters 2016 did, it's already in a better position because of that budget. Again, $75 million for Ghostbusters Afterlife versus the $152 million for Ghostbusters 2016. That alone is going to make a huge difference. Because even if this movie somehow comes in underneath some of these other movies, what that still means is that it's going to be more successful on paper because of the fact that it costs less. So... 
We, of course, will be following this as the release continues to go on. Again, I have my box office charts, of course, going over all of this information. So worldwide, it had a $60 million opening weekend. That is, of course, Ghostbusters After Life. And uh, just for anyone who's interested, the break-even number, because of a low production budget and typical marketing costs, the break-even for Ghostbusters Afterlife is $187.5 million. I think that's doable. I think that's very much doable. So even if it doesn't get to the same level, if it can at least get within striking distance, which I think is possible, hey, it's making money. Where Ghostbusters 2016 cannot say the same thing at all. And now for a huge shout out to all of my November Patreon, Subscribestar, and Locals members. Starting first off with Patreon, Andrew Hoyle, Animation Commentator, Brandon, Brian P., Christopher Bowman, Dolores Ed, Dion, Father Christopher Miller, Hail to you, Father, Father Damian Cook, Garrett Searles, Harold Francis, Inflamed Wood, Jacob the Juice, JC, Jeffrey Toon, Joe Horn, Jonathan Carney, Gomer Kyle 79, Laura the Modern Major General Story, Mike Jackson, Mad Mitch Dunaway, Mondo Spieler, Mr. Peabody, On to June, Orange Hat Reviews, Out of Step with Reality, Priscilla Hall, Rosetta Allen, Stan Andrian, Teresa Martin, Theodore Benden, Tina Bojan, and Tina B, the Empress of the Universe. And a shout out to my subscribe star members, UAB, Mad Dog, Storm Tracker, The R, Fast Reaction, Nosferatu Gatsu, Stan 4, John B, Perpetual Punster, Mr. Roy, Glinzer, J, Alex McCarthy Jr., Dean Heiss, slash the new number two, and J Rod, the Beer Guru, and of course, ZK Man. Thank you very much for supporting me over there. And to my three supporters over on Locals.com, Kara Tharp, Bifford the Hobbit, and Robert Barnes. You guys are all amazing and beautiful people. And if you want your name shout out at the end of every live stream and every video I do on the channel, check out that top link in the description below to find out how to sign up to the various levels that exist, including the most basic level where you get a shout out, the secondary level, the Army of Asgard, where you get that, plus access to a giveaways exclusive server where I give away things like 4Ks and Blu-rays and digital codes. All kinds of stuff, a lot of fun. You then also have the Keeper of the Bifrost level where you get all that stuff plus access to an exclusive podcast that I do with John the Flick Pick Flickinger. You get to ask us questions and you get also access to that and the entire library of podcast episodes that we have done. And then there is, of course, the Chosen of Valhalla level where not only do you get all of that, but also in your first month, you get a t-shirt of your choice and sent to you anywhere in the world. Of course, just let me know your size and the color option that you want. It'll be sent to you that first month. And also you get to be featured on the once a month chosen of Valhalla live stream where we have a ton of fun talking about movies and projects and all kinds of stuff pretty much anything that the chosen wants to talk about is on the table so if any of that sounds interesting to you check out that top link you're all amazing and beautiful people hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day and as always god bless